Just after midnight on Saturday, June 17, 1972, at the Watergate Complex in Washington, D.C., security guard Frank Wills was conducting his usual nightly rounds. Being the thorough security guard that he was, he noticed something was strange. Tape was stuck to the latches on the doors leading from the underground car park up to the offices of the Democratic National Committee. The tape allowed the doors to shut but remain unlatched and unlocked. Frank removed the tape, assuming it was placed there inadvertently. A short time later, Frank returned to the area and discovered that someone was in the building and had retaped the latches on the doors. Suspecting a break-in, Frank called the police. Across the street, inside a hotel room with a clear view of the Watergate complex and DNC headquarter offices, Alfred Baldwin had set down his binoculars, distracted by the film Attack of the Puppet People, playing on his hotel TV. If he had been observing the building like he was supposed to be, he would have seen three plainclothes police officers pull up and head straight for the DNC sixth floor office suite. By the time he realized what was happening inside the building, it was too late. The police apprehended five men inside the DNC headquarters. They were later charged with attempted burglary and attempted interception of telephone and other communications. Within hours of the burglars' arrests, the FBI discovered that two of the men had connections to E. Howard Hunt, a CIA operative who himself had connections to Nixon's secret group known as the White House Plumbers, established to help stop security leaks and covertly investigate other sensitive security matters. What followed was a cover-up, and then a cover-up of the cover-up that would unravel the United States presidency and put the country's system of checks and balances to the test in a way that was unprecedented in the history of the country. Nixon's playbook of denial, deception, and disinformation was later put on steroids and applied throughout the Trump presidency in ways we're just now uncovering. Nixon walked so that Trump could run, and we're still dealing with the fallout from Watergate to this day. This is how the Watergate scandal changed American politics forever. Roll the intro. Thank you to Factor for partnering with me on today's video. Y'all, it is summertime, and I am trying to have the fullest, bestest, hot girl summer a gal can have. And you know what that means? I don't have time to cook, and I don't want to stand in a hot kitchen. But I also don't want to spend a ton of money on takeout all the time because I'm trying to be fiscally responsible. What's a girl to do? Factor. That's what. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen meals directly to your doorstep. So you can skip the time prepping and cooking and cleaning in the hot kitchen, eat something truly delicious, and then get back to enjoying your summer already. They offer a ton of options to choose from like keto and vegetarian. So you can pick a plan that fits your lifestyle. I recently tried their garlic and herb chicken breast and it was so tasty. Without fail, their meals are flavorful, never dry, and consistently very delicious. That's why I keep working with them. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code LEGIA50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Thanks, Factor. After Nixon was elected president in 1968, the Committee to Re-elect the President, or CRP for short, was founded as a fundraising committee to help secure Nixon's 1972 re-election campaign. But that committee, well, they were willing to do a lot more than silly little fundraising events and voter registration drives to try to get their man re-elected. No, no, they wanted to commit crimes. B&Es, wiretapping, espionage, covert surveillance. They wanted to be secret spy agents. And so they made a plan. They would break into the Democratic National Committee headquarters, take pictures of important documents, and plant wiretaps so that they could gather information that would help them win the 1972 election for their Republican, Richard Nixon. In January 1972, Gordon Liddy, the finance counsel for the CRP, presented a campaign intelligence plan to CRP leadership, including former Attorney General John Mitchell, and the plan included illegal activities against the Democratic Party. After some revisions, Mitchell and other CRP leaders approved the plan. By May 1972, the CRP started executing their plan. They paid burglars who broke into DNC headquarters and wiretapped two phones, including DNC chairman Larry O'Brien. Not long after, however, the committee discovered that the listening devices that they had planted in the DNC needed repairs. So the group again planned to break into DNC headquarters to do those repairs and take some more pictures. This time, however, they got caught. The immediate fallout from the attempted burglary and subsequent arrests was 
subdued. Nixon played dumb. His press secretary called it nothing more than a third-rate burglary attempt. At an August 29th press conference, Nixon stated, I can say categorically that no one in the White House staff, no one in this administration presently employed, was involved in this very bizarre incident. Behind the scenes, however, the cover-up had already begun. Martha Mitchell, the wife of former Attorney General John Mitchell, who was, you'll recall, the head of the CRP, she made the connection that the CRP and her husband knew the men who had been arrested for the burglary and were likely behind the whole incident. She tried to speak to the press. Five days after the break-in, Martha was on the phone with a reporter saying that she would leave her husband if he didn't quit the dirty business of politics when the conversation ended abruptly. And Martha could be heard in the background telling someone to get away from her. Then the line went dead. A former FBI agent had ripped the cord out of the wall and forcibly restrained her. She would be held captive for five days and forcibly sedated to keep her from sharing what she knew with the media. During this time, the FBI was investigating the Watergate incident, and a mysterious FBI source, nicknamed Deep Throat, was feeding Washington Post reporters information about what the FBI was finding. On August 1st, the FBI found that a $25,000 cashier's check, worth $175,000 in today's money, was deposited into the bank accounts of one of the men arrested at Watergate that night. The kicker? The check was from a private individual and made out to the committee to re-elect the president. How did a check, meant for Nixon's re-election campaign, end up in the bank account of the unknown burglar who had then used that money to buy the hardware to use to break into the DNC? The plot thickens. On October 10th, less than one month before the 1972 election, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein of the Washington Post reported that the FBI had determined that the Watergate break-in was part of a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage on behalf of the Nixon re-election committee. The Nixon campaign was immediately on the defensive, endlessly attacking the Washington Post for its disinformation and campaign of fake news against the president. The Washington Post reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, were relentlessly dedicated to uncovering the scandal, and they had a hunch that something big was brewing. The rest of the media, however, either downplayed it or failed entirely to cover the story at all. In the meantime, Nixon had a huge re-election budget, solid approval ratings, and recent successes, opening China to the world with a visit that year, as well as achieving detente with the Soviet Union. And these successes were used to drown out the calls by the Washington Post that something was amiss. Less than a month after the Washington Post revealed that Watergate was connected to Nixon's re-election campaign, Nixon won the 1972 presidential election in one of the biggest landslides in American political history. In January 1973, right before Nixon's inauguration for his second term, the trial began against the seven men accused of participating in and orchestrating the Watergate break-in. Five of the men, including CIA operative E. Howard Hunt, pled guilty. Gordon Liddy and James McCord refused to cooperate, and they were convicted. Old James McCord, though, he had a change of heart. So before sentencing, he wrote the judge a letter saying, officials, high up in the White House had orchestrated the plot and had pressured the defendants to plead guilty and take the fall. When McCord's letter to the judge was released, it sent ripples through the country. What the Washington Post reporters had been screaming for months became incredibly apparent. The Watergate break-in was just the tip of the iceberg. This wasn't a simple criminal case. This was a political scandal that quickly captured national attention. In May of 1973, the Senate officially created the Watergate Committee to investigate the CRP, the president, and the lead-up and subsequent cover-up of the Watergate break-in. You know the January 6th committee and all those televised hearings that they held? Yeah, the Watergate committee was like that. The DOJ launched its own independent investigation, led by special counsel Archibald Cox. Consider him the Bob Mueller or John Smith of the Watergate scandal. Ah, how history loves to repeat itself. And if you remember the January 6th committee hearings, well, the Watergate hearings were like that, but on steroids. They were broadcast on every major news network throughout the summer of 1973, and over 70% of American households with TVs tuned in to watch as the hearings unfolded. The bombshell came on Monday, July 16th, when White House assistant Alexander Butterfield appeared to testify. Correct. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices 
Yes, sir. With the revelation that Nixon had been recording everything said inside the Oval Office since 1970, the nature of the investigation changed. It became focused intensely on gaining access to those tapes to determine definitively whether Nixon was involved in the Watergate plot and what he did to cover it up. Cox immediately subpoenaed the tapes as part of the DOJ investigation, as did the Senate Watergate Committee. But Nixon refused to comply. It doesn't look good. Richie. His reason for why he didn't believe he had to comply with the subpoena? Executive privilege. Sound familiar? Two weeks later, the judge involved with the Watergate investigation ordered Nixon to hand over nine tapes for private review. And two months later, in October 1973, Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned amid charges of receiving thousands of dollars in kickbacks and other improper payments throughout his political career and into his vice presidency. Nixon named then House Minority Leader Gerald Ford as his new vice president two days later. Meanwhile, Nixon continued fighting the subpoena for his tapes and court. After the appeals court ruled that no, executive privilege didn't apply and yes, he would have to hand over those tapes, Nixon began feeling the walls closing in on him. In a panic on October 20th, 1973, Nixon asked Cox, the special investigator trying to get his hands on those tapes, yeah, he asked him to resign and Cox refused. Nixon then asked Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire Cox. Richardson refused, and in protest, he resigned his post as Attorney General. So then Nixon ordered Richardson's assistant, William Ruckelshaus, to fire Cox, and he also refused and then resigned. Next in line was Solicitor General Robert Bork, and he finally was like, fine, I'll do it. And Bork finally fired Cox, putting an end to the night history would call the Saturday Night Massacre. Less than a month later, in November 1973, Nixon urged the nation to just get over Watergate already, uttering what would become his most infamous line, I'm not a crook. Because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. That same week, the White House told the Senate and the DOJ Special Watergate investigation that, oops, we can't find two of those tapes you asked for. And also, oops, one of the tapes just has 18 and a half minutes of silence right in the middle and we don't know how that happened. Despite this, and after a year of investigations, in March of 1974, a grand jury in Washington, D.C. voted to indict seven former aides of President Nixon for conspiring to hinder the Watergate investigation, including former Attorney General John Mitchell. You know, the one who had his own wife held hostage so she wouldn't tell the media. John Mitchell as Attorney General was known for his gruffness and strong, tough on crime, law and order stance. So it was incredibly ironic that he was indicted and later sent to prison for obstruction of justice, conspiracy and perjury in relation to his planning and cover up of the Watergate scandal. In that same indictment, Nixon was secretly named as an unindicted co-conspirator under the belief that he couldn't be formally indicted while he was a sitting president, even though they had lots and lots of evidence to believe he was definitely guilty of some crimes. After this, things quickly began unraveling for Nixon. In April 1974, the DOJ subpoenaed 64 more Nixon tapes. In May, the House Judiciary Committee began hearings on whether to write up articles of impeachment. In July, the Supreme Court definitively ruled that Nixon's tapes were not protected by executive privilege. And by the end of July, the House Judiciary Committee adopted three articles of impeachment against the president for obstructing the Watergate investigation, misuse of power and violating his oath of office, and failure to comply with White House subpoenas. Then, on August 5th, 1974, having lost his executive privilege argument at the Supreme Court, Nixon released transcripts of three conversations he had six days after the Watergate break-in. These transcripts would become known as the smoking gun of the Watergate investigation. They showed Nixon ordering the FBI to stop its investigation into the break-in and directing a cover-up of the entire scandal. Three days later, before formal impeachment proceedings could begin, Nixon stunned the nation in a televised address by announcing that he would be resigning the presidency effective at noon the next day. The next day, on August 9th, 1974, Vice President Gerald Ford, who 10 months earlier had just been the minority leader in the House of Representatives, became the 38th President of the United States. A month later, President Gerald Ford granted Nixon a full, free, and absolute pardon for all offenses against the United States. Nixon maintained his innocence until his death in 1994. Overall, 69 people were indicted and 48 people were convicted for participating in or covering up the Watergate 
break in. Republicans lost tons of seats in the next 1974 midterm elections as cynicism and distrust of government increased from the Watergate incident combined with fallout from the failures of the Vietnam War. Congress made moves to significantly limit the power of the executive branch, including passage of the Privacy Act of 1974, which established fair information practices related to the collection and use of information about individuals maintained by federal agencies like the FBI. The Church Committee in the Senate held hearings to unearth other covert government activities and domestic spying, uncovering evidence that the CIA had spied on domestic political opponents, carried out assassinations overseas, and experimented with LSD on unwitting Americans. These revelations further eroded the nation's trust in government. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978 created tight controls for CIA wiretaps and other investigation methods, and created a stronger system of checks and balances to mitigate against future amassing of power by the CIA director. Most law schools around the country instituted a policy requiring ethics courses, and the American Bar Association created a stronger professional responsibility code in response to Watergate, because nearly half of the people indicted during the scandal were lawyers. In other reforms, caps were placed on campaign contributions, transparency laws were strengthened, and new laws codified how an independent counsel would investigate future presidents. This string of reforms gave more power to Congress and took it away from the president in order to try to curb any future executive misbehavior and avoid a similar constitutional crisis. Despite these reforms, Watergate did irreparable damage to America's collective faith in government, how we think about the presidency, and how we view politicians. Nixon's successors, Ford and Carter, were unable to secure second terms. Then came Reagan in the 1980s, and he brought back some of that shiny veneer to the presidency, despite the fact that he did ruin everything. And in the decades since Watergate, many of those reforms have been rolled back. Court rulings set campaign financing restrictions back. Surveillance increased dramatically after the 9-11 attacks. Trump was able to fire inspectors general with no legal consequences. And the independent counsel statute expired in 1999, meaning that Trump's own attorney generals were able to appoint special counsels, which is exactly what post-Watergate reforms were meant to avoid. Trump, for his part, seems to be well aware of the Watergate scandal, despite the fact that I'm not certain that Trump is literate. But because 50 years have passed since the scandal erupted, and today we generally have a pretty tenuous collective grasp on the details and what the fallout of Watergate was, Trump has been able to rewrite the history of Watergate in a way that speaks volumes about his opinion on how much impunity with which a president should be able to act. In the early days of his candidacy for president, Trump pointed to Hillary's private email server as magnitudes worse than Watergate. This magnitudes worse in my opinion, and in the opinion of many people in law enforcement, this is worse than Watergate, what's going on with this. This despite the fact that Trump openly embraced many Nixonisms, including his law and order campaign rhetoric from 1968. Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, confirmed that Trump would base his nomination acceptance speech on the one that Nixon used in 1968. And in tweets and speeches throughout his campaign and presidency, Trump repurposed Nixon quotes and phrases, including using terms like lawlessness and echoing Nixon's fears about a frightening trend of crime and anarchy, especially during the protests that erupted after after the murder of George Floyd here in Minneapolis. Not to mention that his obsession with discrediting the mainstream news media closely mirrors the ways in which Nixon attempted to discredit the media, especially during the Watergate investigations. What is it about the television coverage of you in these past weeks and months that has so aroused your anger? Don't get the impression that you arouse my anger. <laughs> One can only be angry with those he respects. They will say, Donald Trump rants and raves at the press. I'm not ranting and raving. I'm just telling you, you know, you're dishonest people. But, but, I'm not ranting and raving. And this isn't hypothetical. Trump literally knew Nixon. He was close with Nixon advisor Roy Cohn and friends with Nixon's Treasury Secretary John B. Connolly. Trump and Nixon spent a weekend together in 1989, celebrating Connolly's birthday, sharing dinner together, and riding back to New York on Trump's private jet together. Nixon wrote Trump a letter saying Nixon's wife had predicted that whenever you decide to run for office, you will be a winner. All of this makes Trump's cognitive dissonance around the Watergate scandal all the more puzzling. Hillary's emails are worse than Watergate. Nixon is someone to be venerated and whose political style Trump is mimicking in many ways. But also, according to Trump, Nixon may not have been guilty and was a coward for quitting. He left. I didn't leave, Trump said in 2019. Big difference. I don't leave. Basically, Nixon screwed up. 
he got caught. Meanwhile, people on the left hurl accusations that Trump's actions are worse than or akin to Watergate. Like, for instance, when he fired FBI Director James Comey, or asked the FBI to stop investigating his national security advisor Michael Flynn, or tried to interfere with Robert Mueller's investigation, or withheld troops while urging Ukraine to investigate his political opponent Joe Biden. But Trump's retelling of Watergate has sown enough seeds of doubt that he's able to manipulate history for his supporters, spinning it into another example of how there are conspiracies at every turn meant to take powerful people like Trump down, which is the same rhetoric Trump turns to when any accusation of wrongdoing is thrown his way, from sexual misconduct to high crimes and misdemeanors. According to historian Michael Gerhardt, truth doesn't matter. What matters is the narrative. It's much more important what people believe than what they know. By changing the Watergate narrative, Trump has opportunities to manipulate history, and his lawyers have opportunities to go to court and relitigate the same questions that Nixon faced and lost. The Supreme Court found against Nixon then, but maybe they got it wrong. Or that's what Trump and his lawyers want to argue. Trump doesn't have to respond to subpoenas or submit to investigations. The president can bypass Congress, open DOJ cases and investigations against his enemies, and authorize the assassination of an Iranian commander without telling Congress, etc., etc., etc. During the FBI search of his Mar-a-Lago home, Trump claimed it was a Watergate-style violation, which is a strange and inaccurate comparison. According to a recent Politico article, if everything is worse than Watergate, Watergate becomes run-of-the-mill political intrigue, not the archetype of presidential corruption. It creates a kind of numbing effect, a numbing effect Trump can use to normalize his own behavior. And the two men marry each other in many other ways. Nixon was the first criminal president and the first president to resign the post. Trump is the first former president to be arrested and face federal charges. Both seem to have a general lack of regard for democratic processes and a will to gain power no matter what it takes. Both exhibit extreme paranoia and insecurity and isolationism. Nixon purposely organized his schedule so he would interact with as few people as possible. Trump famously spent hours every day alone watching cable news. Both repeatedly railed against the news media, especially at the height of investigations into them. The fake news is, in fact, and I hate to say this, in fact, the enemy of the people. The press is the enemy. The press is the enemy. The press is the enemy. The establishment is the enemy. The professors are the enemy. The professors are the enemy. Write that in the black. The thing that's different now is that Republicans then were more willing to believe facts. Today, the facts themselves are up for debate, leading to partisan chaos and a Republican Party that, paradoxically, follows Trump while also shouting for law and order. And of course, the increased trend of social media siloing people based on their political party and feeding the masses disinformation means, more than ever, we do not trust our government. But depending on your political position, the reasons for this distrust are very, very different. And when a former president seeking re-election is spouting disinformation at every opportunity, and that same disinformation has uprooted an entire party's grasp on reality, it becomes harder and harder to tell fact from fiction. And the result is an entire electorate that distrusts the government, doesn't believe in the democratic process, and feels more than ever that the system is rigged against them. If you like this video and want to learn more, I suggest watching my video from last week all about why Republicans fall for fake news. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, including my newest patron and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum patron, Brett Piantek. If you're interested in behind the scenes content, access to my research and show notes, content about my dog and all sorts of other stuff, consider joining me over on Patreon today. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.